Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Buck, and I'm an alcoholic. How are y'all? Whenever I have the privilege of speaking, by the way, congratulations for what a great sober fest this 85 has been. I've had a great time, and it's a great privilege to be asked to talk at any time in AA, but particularly at a big uh, festive occasion. I love it. And um, what I do when I talk is I do two things. I, I use as an outline our preamble to the best of my ability. So that I, I will remember that my primary purpose of being up here is to keep Buck sober. And then, having achieved that, to help the new person to find uh, this program. And the new person in my book is that person, like we saw that stood up uh, from treatment center the first day, first week, first month, first year. There have been some people that have been around AA longer than I have been in AA. There's a little different. So they're all new. And uh, get this spiritual program started. Uh, This is the furthest out west I've ever been invited. So maybe my favorite AA story will be all right. Uh, However, Johnny Carson did get a hold of it one time and uh, published it national, ruined it. But uh, it goes like this. There was a fellow that was talking at a big meeting like this. And he had he was one of the richest men in the world. And his purpose of going to meetings like these, these big meetings, weren't AA, was to tell them how he got so rich. And uh, so they're all there. And he says, you remember, I had a little store here in Salem. And the Safeway put a big store up and they squeezed me out. And they gave me $10,000. I couldn't compete with them. So he said, I took that $10,000 and I headed right out to Las Vegas. And he said, out in Las Vegas, within a couple of hours, I'd lost every cent I came out there with. I was completely broke. And about that time, I had to use the toilet facilities. And I went in there and you needed a dime. And I didn't have a dime. And I stood out in front, humiliated and begged for the dime. Finally, some guy felt sorry for me, gave me a dime, and next thing I walked in, and the, I didn't need the dime. The door was open. So when I finished, I came out, and I put that dime in a slot machine, and by God, I hit a jackpot, and I hit another one, and another one. I got to the crap tables, and I couldn't lose. By the end of a month, I'd won over $300,000. I invested it in oil and land. Until everything just went fine, until today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm one of the wealthiest men in the world, and I'm here to share this knowledge, this great life with you, because I'm looking for that person who gave me the chance. And way in the back of the room, this guy's wildly holding up his hands, and he said, what's the matter with you back there? He said, I am the guy you're looking for. He said, what do you mean? He said, I'm the guy that gave you that dime. He said, I'm not looking for you. I'm looking for the guy that left the door open. (laughs) So I think all of us speakers, whenever we have uh, the privilege of speaking, I think all of us hope hope that at the end something we say will leave the door to this wonderful life that we have found here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I think that's the main purpose of us talking up here. We could very easily... Make a very short talk of it. There was this, uh, for instance, there was this um, Indian brave who was uh, drunk all the time. He was out on a reservation. He would fought and disturbed the reservation, the peace of it and everything else, till finally the, the chiefs and all got together and they exiled him from the reservation. He said, never come back again, and he left. And a few years later, the word came to the chief. He's on the reservation, and way off you could see a cloud of dust. And uh, as it, the dust got clearer and closer, it turned out to be a beautiful new Cadillac 
Behind it was the Indian brave, and snuggled up next, next to him was this beautiful little squaw. And the chief walks out, and he says, How? And the brave said, Don't drink and go to AA meetings. <laughs> And that is the how. That would be the, that is the whole story. Don't drink and go to AA meetings, but that wouldn't be much fun if we did that. I'll give you my background. Has nothing to do with my alcoholism. I don't think any of our backgrounds have anything to do with whether we became alcoholic or not, except that we were born. And I was born. And, uh, I was one of ten kids. And I had a happy childhood. I mentioned, this has nothing to do with it, but, it offsets some people uh, have a very tragic and unhappy childhood. And again, that has nothing to do with it any more than whether you have arthritis or not. But anyway, you know, it helps to relate. Had a happy childhood, started drinking early, very young, kid stuff, got drunk first time, tried to get drunk every time after that. Some people said they never wanted to get drunk. I wouldn't have brought the stuff if I couldn't have gotten drunk. That's as simple as that with me. I wanted the effect. If I'd ever brought, I wouldn't buy when they came out with light whiskey. You know, that light beer in you. They came, Calvert came out with light whiskey. Man, I avoided that like the plague. I wouldn't touch it. The only way they could make it light, as far as I was concerned, was by watering it. So I drank for the effect, and I had a very exciting, enjoyable time with it. I wasn't, I don't think I had problems. I probably with problems to my parents and teachers, but I mean in a serious vein. And it was innocuous. Uh, but I continued drinking. Whenever and after I got out of school and got to working with national companies, I, and my income increased, I uh, drank more and better. And um, then the war came. Oh, I met my wife uh, to be. The war was heating up in Europe. We called it a phony war then. Nobody really thought it was going to happen. Uh, French was sitting in the Maginot Line, and no, nothing was going on. And they had the draft going. I'd been 1B in the draft, which was next to 4F. 1B uh, was for physical defect. I had a deflected septum, still have it. But anyway, um, the doctor examined me. That was his specialty, so he flunked me. I became 1B, and uh, I had been gone with my um, wife for about three years. I want to tell you something. She met me in a drinking situation. I never let her forget that. <laughs> I never let her forget that. I was minding my own business in my favorite neighborhood bar, uh, drinking, uh, and uh, a friend of mine said, there's a couple of friends of mine passing through town, I'd like you to meet them, and a couple of good-looking girls, I went over, and I, um, not while I was talking, I use my hands even now, I can't talk without my hands, and I was talking, and I knocked a beer over on me, and, um, now, this was way back. You know, some of the language you hear in AA now, you know, can curl your hair sometime. But all I said, and of course it was terrible. Oh, everybody in the ballroom, and this wasn't a high-class place, we were shocked. Because I said, my God, I look like I wet my pants. And we were, oh, oh, did you hear what he said? And uh, my wife's nose went up in the air and her girlfriend, and they dismissed me. And the next day, my friend gave me cane about it. And he said, you ought to go around and apologize to them for that statement. And uh, you can tell it was a different age, right? <laughs> God, watch television here. It makes us... Anyway, I went around, and uh, I didn't like my wife to be, and she didn't like me. I liked her girlfriend uh, a little better. She seemed to have a better sense of humor. <laughs> but my mother liked her very much, and next thing I knew, we were going together. And uh, we were going to get married, And uh, but this wall was heating up, so they started letting people out at uh, 26. I was 24. So, okay, let's get married. It's not going to be anything now. That, they're letting them out at 26. They're definitely not going to take them in at 24. So we got married on November the 29th, went on our honeymoon, got back on December the 7th, and they bombed Pearl Harbor. Boy, I was hit. But anyway, we, um, um, I was like a civilian, and 
everybody would say, how come you're not in the service? My son is, and I'm a sales manager with Sperry Rand. And uh, I uh, stuttered just like you apologized for not drinking. And then all my buddies started being drafted in, taken in. And then I started getting on these crying drunks. And um, so I've been married a few months. My wife said, if you want to go in so much, you got so much mouth when you're drinking, why don't you go down and enlist? And I went down and uh, tried to enlist in the infantry because I figured they wouldn't worry about your nose. And uh, I didn't want to miss out on it. And I was fed up with marriage by now. I'd been married for three months. <laughs> the restraints of marriage already were telling on me. So this guy said, uh, say, we could use people like you. Uh, you're older than most of them come down here. Are you interested in flying? And I said, no. I'm not interested in flying. He said, well, you're the type we want in the Air Corps, the Army Air Corps. He said, you know, we don't want these kids that know it all. We want stable, elderly people like you. <laughs> you know? And he said, if you come in, we're not going to even pull you in until about six months from now when the cadet program has space for you. And you can stay right with your company and stay as a civilian. So then I did. They swore me in as a private. And I'd go around and people would now ask me and I told them I was with the uh, inspector general's office. I was an agent, you know. Show them my identification that I was a private in the... Uh, when I told them I was like an agent, like, you know, a little dramatic... People looked up to me. Anyway, we finally, uh, finally my wife uh, announced she was pregnant, and in the same day of that announcement, I got my notice to report to Nashville, Tennessee, and went in and ended up, to bring a shot, I ended up uh, flying over in China with General Chenault and the 14th Air Force Flying Tigers. I hear there's somebody in this room, Mary was telling me, from Quay Lin. I was with the 11th Bomb Squadron, and the only other people up there were fighters. So we had bombers. Anyway, I was drinking a lot, but no, I don't call this alcoholism. I'm just bringing this up. For this reason, I would never drink when I was scheduled to fly. And number one, there wasn't too much uh, booze over there available. They wouldn't fly it over the hump to us, even though as officers we were entitled. So we drank the native, the boo-how rum and boo-how gin. Boo-how rye. Boo-how means very bad. <laughs> And it was. But it didn't stop me. When I wasn't flying, I'd drink anything I'd get a hold of. And they have over there, and guys would say, how can you drink that with all them bugs in it? You know, they put, the Chinese would have lizards and bugs and things in that to, to kill the evil spirits in the bottle. But that didn't deter me, you know. Anyway, the uh, we had a successful war. We had an exciting time. We had, I uh, looking back, I enjoyed it. Uh, I like the adventure. I think most people I've met in AA have a, a zest for adventure. That's why I love the people so much in AA. They keep the life exciting. And uh, I came back, and Sperry Rand rolled out the red carpet for us, and everything was coming up. Rose bought a home, you know, the regular thing, started lodging our family, and I started making more money. All the guys that had been my buddies who hadn't been in the service were now big shots. And they were looking out for a war hero, Bucky Doyle. And they cut a pass as high as I wanted to go in Sperry Rand. And I was on my way. And the income blossomed up. And everything was going great. I didn't drink on the job. I drank a lot. I always drank a lot. I was a, a hell fellow well met, a sociable drunk. That's what I was. I, I, wasn't a, I, was, I didn't offend people. I... You know, I I was fast with the buck, the big shots, you know, and uh, and ha ha ha, you know, and always laughing, but not hurting anybody that I can really see. And my wife um, wasn't complaining. My family enjoyed my uh, company, and everything was going great. And then I crossed that invisible line, and you know what? I have now determined after having going to 11,000 meetings and had the help of y'all in researching myself of at least listening to 25,000 of you. I have now determined the exact day, I think, 
that Buck Doyle manifested his alcoholism. Maybe I was born, I was probably born an alcoholic, but it hadn't shown up. Except you guys are here, you wanted to say everybody got drunk was an alcoholic, but hell, it wasn't interfering in any major portion of my life. It was my recreation. It was my fun. It was my social life. And then I crossed that invisible line, and the day I crossed it, and why I'm so sure now that that was the day, it was on February the 15th, 1947, at the Translux Cocktail Lounge, which is no longer there. It's a big office building down at 14th and New York Avenue. They're gonna put a, I'm going to put a monument there someday, but that's where I, I did it. Now, why did I say that? All right, I'll tell you why. Number one, my wife and one of my sisters got together and decided to have a surprise drinking party for me for my 30th birthday. That was the day. Now, you know, wives and family don't get together and get booze for us alcoholics. So I must have had a pretty pure record up to that moment. But down there at the Translux, there was a transformation. I got to be a Jekyll and a Hyde. I changed. I don't know any of this. I, I went in a real bad blackout for the first time in my life. So most of this was reported to me. I got nasty. I got obscene. Mouth talking filthy, which I don't do. And as a general, I, I never do in mixed company. I know all the cuss words, of course, most of us do. But this time I used the real rotten thing. I was a slob. I got in a fight. I never was a fighting type punk. I got in a fight. The police came. And now here I am. I'm a sort of a young executive with Sperry Rand. The police came. I had contributed. At that time, the police used to take up the boys club collection, and I was did pretty good by him, and so Officer Kurtz saved me from being hauled off to jail. He said, let's get this bum out of here. And he said, no. He, and I probably overheard this because I played on later. He said, he had a pretty tough time in the war. He thought I was shell-shocked. <laughs> battle shock, he said. Battle shock. It was bottle shock. What was that mean? <laughs> but anyway... He kept him from locking me up, so I got home. Next day, I get all of this horrible stuff. Oh, I ended up on a crying jag. And if that isn't embarrassing for a war hero to be sobbing away, and then people say, who died? Somebody died in your family. I saw you crying down. Oh, God. Just still thinking of it, almost. It was most... Now, from that day on, now, I didn't know this. This is hindsight. You know, hindsight is an exact science. So I'm doing this as an exact science, hindsight. But from that day on, you could not have told me this, but now for almost seven more years, I drank sick. I drank sick. I was, uh, looking back, I can see it now, but you couldn't have convinced me. I knew people had changed. I knew people had started betraying me. The wife started raising hell at home, I said, look, damn you, you met me in a bar room, so don't act so shocked, you know. I thought she was complaining about my drinking. She thought she was too. You know, when the people close to us are doing it, I'll tell you, if you knew, they're not complaining. They think that she thought she was complaining about my drinking. I thought she was complaining about my drinking. But generally, she was complaining about she saw alcoholism and didn't know what it was. That was what she was complaining about. I was a different person. I wasn't a guy that she married. I wasn't a guy that we'd had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. For the next almost seven years, it was sick. Oh, I was sure there were. I wasn't drunk every day. Oh, by the way, at the Translux that day, a very fine guy, a wonderful guy, I often tried to make amends to him. Never could. Never would let me. One of the only people I really felt was at a very important job in the government. It helped me a lot in my career. Took time off to come down there, and I insulted his wife. I never did things like this. I thought, maybe I am insane. Talk about us costing a company business. That man never brought another penny 
Miss Barry Moran. I didn't go down and announce it to them. He might have told them, but uh, anyway. But he never, you know, he never did. And I tried to follow. He said, I don't need it. After I came in AA, I tried to see him. And he said, I don't need to listen to that crap from you. You know, how people, you know, we hurt. So I had never been like that before. And I just uh, became paranoid. I figured people are exaggerating my situation. They're, they're telling tales around. They're stabbing me in the back. Oh, my what they now call upward mobility in Sperry Ran on February the 15th, 1947, also ceased. He probably called him up, you know, or somebody told him, one of them traitors. Anyway, from that day on, I, I had a good job. But I never went any place. I never moved off of the plateau of uh, just staying in a good job. But uh, promotions would come. People I trained would get them, dip, dip, and I'd go straight through, so, even after I got sober. So um, I kept this up until I was forced to come into AA. When Jack talked, remind, you know, we always get bits and pieces of our own story out of it. There was a priest that invaded my home. You know, the very few people can dare come in uninvited into your home. Maybe your doctor or your minister or your lawyer. Maybe your CPA might butt in some. Mine did. But, in fact, a lot of people butted on me. But one day, one evening, I was attacked in my home by a priest. <laughs> And he came in and he said, Mr. Doyle, I came here to wish you sort of a belated new, Happy New Year. I didn't know you were a drunk. A drunk? I said, what are you talking about, Father O'Hara? I'm no drunk. I was drunk. Because a lot of it had to be reported to me. I said, what are you doing here? Who, who asked you to come up here? My wife? Are you listening to her out there? She's a sick woman. That's the trouble with you, priest. You don't understand women. <laughs> She's gone through a change of life. She was about 30. <laughs> That's the trouble with you, birds. That's the trouble with y'all. He said, Mr. Dog, your wife didn't ask me to come here. Who did? I'm not at liberty to tell you. I said, well, I think it's outrageous. I donated a pew down there. I'm active in the church. I'm active in bingo. I do all these good things. I'm a bartender at the Knights of Columbus. I take up the collection on Sunday. And you're coming here calling me terrible names. Yes, I drink. Are you against drinking? No. But he says, why don't you just cut it down and just drink on weekends? This good priest knew nothing, nothing at all about alcoholics or alcoholism. But he had one thing going for me. A member of the parish had gone to him and said, Father, if you ever have a drunk in the parish that you can't talk to, call me. I'm a member of AA, and I'll go with you, and I, I may be able to talk to him with you. So he said, like MacArthur, when he left there that night, and this was all reported to me, they said, he said he will return. <laughs> and um, very shortly, he returned. Now he's bringing in the neighborhood. He's got that stranger. I didn't like him, but I'm sober. I could stop drinking. Boy, I, I, that was one thing I could always stop. That's what will kill an alcoholic. You know. I, I could stop any time. Well, I could. If I got too sick, I'd stop. If I got in too much trouble, I didn't want to see the garbage anymore. I didn't know about the first drink getting you drunk. I, I got, you know, as I say, I was holding down still a responsible job. I wasn't stumbling around drunk all the time. Here's what my problem was. I hadn't yet become addicted to alcohol. And thanks to you people, I really never did. But here was my problem with that hindsight, that exact sign. After I took a drink, I could never guarantee what was going to result? And as a general rule, it wasn't bad, cunning, baffling, and powerful. It wasn't, you know, if every time I took a drink, I ended up in jail. Or if every time I took a drink, I was knocked down like this or something. You know, sooner or later, a message would have come through. But I had these fairly decent periods where I didn't do any damage, didn't hurt anybody. Um, didn't get home and all that stuff, but, uh, 
But then I'd take a drink, and I wouldn't know. One time, just show you how we can cost a company. We changed our models in the middle of the year, and they, uh, down on 7th Street, we take it down to the General Service Administration. I had the specification. I'd take them down to put in at a certain time, get them in, and then they go on the catalog. So anybody in the government wanting to buy that new model can spot it and buy it. If it's not there, they can't buy it. So I have all the papers, and I'm going down, and I meet a friend of mine. And we stopped, and we had a drink. And I woke up several days later with the stuff still in my pocket. We never got on, on schedule that year. They never knew that one. They didn't know about that one. I, did, I didn't go in and tell them anything about that. They said, how come we're not on schedule? I said, you know, them damn bureaucrats, a bunch of overpaid government workers, they, they mess up, you know. I don't think that. Because I was becoming an expert liar. But then they showed up there with Charlie, and uh, the only thing he said nice was Father O'Hara and my wife, Charlie. And I, I was like under a lamp in January, and the sweat was pouring off of me. I felt like I was being grilled about the neighborhood break-ins. That's about how I felt. And uh, he said, well, if you, uh, oh, and of course by then I said, yes, I want to do what you want me to, Father. I was trying to let him see what a nice guy I was, and not like the guy he'd seen a little while before. And I said, yes, I want that program. I didn't want that program. I didn't need that program, but anything to quieten down things. I was catching it at work, at home. Now we got the neighborhood in on it. The church is moving in on me. I could deal with the insurance adjusters and things like that, but this is... So we go, and this guy said, hey, if we're going to make a meeting, we better get out of here. Yeah, let's go, man. I got out of that house with him as fast as possible. We get out in the car, and Charlie said, now, look, uh, Mr. Doyle, you got a nice home here. I hear you have a good job. And uh, he said, we shouldn't do this. We don't do it like this in AA. He said, I don't think you need us. He said, but I came along for Father O'Hara. And uh, he said, uh, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I am going to my meeting. I'll drop you off down at Westover at the bar room. And then after the meeting, I'll pick you up. Get yourself a couple of beers. You need them. You know, wouldn't you say, hey, that's a nice guy. Not me. I'm paranoid. Thank God I was paranoid. And I said to myself, who does this monkey think he's dealing with? <laughs> he's fooling with the old fox himself. I see right through the scheme. He's going to drop me off down in Westover, rush back home, pick up Father O'Hara and my wife, and come down and humiliate me in front of the whole damn neighborhood. So I said, no, I want to go to the meetings, and I went. <laughs> we went to it, and ended up going. He said, I said, how often we go to these crazy things? He said, three times a week. I said, three times a week in these Protestant basements? <laughs> I said, my God, the Pope only expects me to go to church down at St. Anne's once a week, Sunday. He said, well, you said you wanted the program. He said, I figured he was going to be carrying tails back, so I didn't tell him that. I said, that's right. And that's your man of your word. I said, that's right. He said, well, if the more meetings you go to, the better chance you have of having a decent program. And then my big mouth has always got me in trouble. I said, well, in that case, we ought to be gone every night. <laughs> and Charlie said, that's a good idea. <laughs> and in those days, there were in a whole Washington area. Today, there's over 150 meetings a night in the same area. But in those days, there were 20 a week. And we had to really do some traveling. Now... I cleared this up the other day on a question. You know, in Washington, D.C., we didn't have, they weren't tiny meetings 30 years ago. They were big meetings, 100, 200, 300 people. But they didn't have many of them. So we had to go and do a lot of traveling to get to them. And in time, you people, by getting to know you, just to shorten it down, I came to really... Uh, like the people in AA. That's what happens to you. If you're new and you're not drinking, I stopped drinking. That was, uh, Number one, you stop drinking. That is the answer to alcoholism, but there is a catch-22, and that is to stay stopped. And most of us have at periods of time stopped. Mary was telling how she 
got so pure and holy all of a sudden at times, you know. And I have been like that, full of resolve, never again to drink, never again. And yet, go right back to it. So staying stops the trick. And you stay stopped by going to AA meetings without drinking. You don't drink and you go to AA meetings. And I suggest, uh, because all I can tell you is how it worked for me and share my experience. And I suggest you go every night for the first six weeks. Some people say 90 meetings in 90 days. And I think that's great too. But I always say exactly how it were, how I did it. I won every night. And it was during that time that I lost this resentment, this hostility, because I was full of it. I knew I didn't belong in AA. I thought it was a great bunch of people. They were real fine if they'd only go after my older brother or somebody like that that needed it and leave me alone because I had a good job. And uh, But I was coming to the meetings. And it doesn't matter why you're coming. I was coming as a complete phony. I had no desire to stop drinking. I had a desire, as we say, to stop hurting, to get, stop being in trouble, to shut people up, everything, but not to, I couldn't imagine a more bleak life than a life without my dear friend, alcohol, who, because of my disease, I couldn't realize had turned on me seven years before. And I was one of the few people that didn't know it had turned on me. But I did, and I got the desire not to drink from the people in AA. And the only way you can get it from them is to not drink and come to the meetings. So you get to know them, you get to like them, believe it or not, because you'll find these are the people you wished you had known when you were drinking. And then you can't help but admire the, the AA people as a group of human beings actually putting into practice things that are not new, but things that we've all been admonished that were the right things to do. And I used to think they were wonderful things in my... 12 years of parochial training, but as I got work in providing you, constricted them to Sundays. And here I found people behaving like this on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and Sundays. They were doing things for me without any hope of uh, any angle. And that befuddled me. I did a lot of good things for a lot of people. Most of us do, particularly if you're in business. I, I would help anybody come to me and wanted some help on getting a job, I'd go all out for him. I was a good guy like that. But in the back, I had a little hook on him. I had a hook. If I can get him in that company, maybe I can get my equipment in there. Oh, yeah, I'll work like that. Tell the boss, hey, let's get this guy a job. His aunt is in charge of purchasing down to beer ships. You know, always a little, you scratch my back. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It's business. But in AA, I saw him doing things without that ulterior hook that happened because they cared for me and for each other and uh, I, I had to have to admire them so when you get to know like and admire somebody you're caught you'll want to be like them and how were they well they said they were alcoholics okay I'm an alcoholic ha 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 and they said they didn't drink okay I don't want to drink without knowing it I'd now become a member of AA I had a desire not to drink for only one reason, because I wanted to be like you, like you people. And y'all didn't drink. That's the only reason I can see. And from there on, my life opened up. And now I'll get to my spiritual part of my program, my talk here tonight. I've given it some thought. One guy said uh, the other day here, what is life? That's a big, tough question. Maybe we'll touch on some of that. But anyway, I started learning things. I was now pretty dry and I was listening and I was getting the wisdom of all the people who had gone before because every time one of us talk we're plagiarizing things that have been passed down we've heard another speaker use we share it, we frame it in our own words but most of it they're the things that you hear today the things I heard from all the speakers here were the same things I heard 31 years ago they have passed the test of truth. They're still true after all this time. There are things that flash through AA. But you don't hear about them much anymore. Maybe out here you do. I don't know. But they aren't anything important. They are nice little things that go through. But the basic things like don't drink, don't take pills, go to meetings, go to meetings. Read the steps. 
All of these things, they've been saying them. All of our little platitudes, pressed corn under glass, I used to call them. Easy does it. First things first. How stupid can they get? It's the wisdom. There's more wisdom in that pressed corn under glass than in a load of books. But I didn't sit at that time until these people started. They started giving me all of this information. They told me. But I had an illness. Nothing wrong with drinking. Most people do it. Well, there's no trouble. But there are few, if you're one of us, I said, that have a fatal progressive disease. It's called alcoholism. Now, don't, don't sit around like I did at first thinking, um, huh, am I or am I not an alcoholic? Well, you know, that's a normal thing, not only for the new person, but even people that have been in for years. I heard a speaker say at his fifth anniversary, he said, you know, five years ago, I quit drinking. I determined I was an alcoholic, and ever since then, I've wondered whether I really am. And he said, I don't know. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not an alcoholic. Maybe I made a mistake. He said, if I did, it was the best mistake I ever made in my life. And, you know, nobody really knows what an alcoholic is. Nobody really knows. Doctors don't know. If you really want to know whether or not you're an alcoholic, the best chance you're going to get to find out is from these people because here for at 24 hours a day for the last 50 years on a round-the-clock basis, we have been the field laboratory of this problem. AA has been the only... Feel laboratory. We're out there on the vomit line. We know what we talk about. We've been there. So, we know. And yet, we will, we don't call you an alcoholic. We allow you to make that distinction. We, we give you many, many definitions. We refer you to our first step, which I couldn't buy. That we we're powerless over alcohol. That our lives were unmanageable. I didn't believe that when I came here. I had a good job. My face was on the company magazine about every month. Uh, I paid my bills and all. I didn't believe it. I knew my brother was an alcoholic, but I didn't buy that. But then, so then there was a thing going around AA that alcoholics are people who can't drink. And I thought, well, if that isn't the biggest bunch of garbage that I ever heard, I can drink more than anybody. Of course, I really had lost my deep capacity, but I didn't know that either. I can drink more than anybody else. Alcoholics or people can't drink. And then I heard of, we had years ago, a nationally famous churchman who was a member, and he spoke in Washington in one of the big banquets. And he, uh, I didn't want to go. It was not in Washington, it was at Alexandria. And my sponsor said, they got a Southeastern Conference coming up, and I want you to go to this meeting. And I said, look, I don't mind going to meetings, but I'm not going to get involved in the business end of this. I said, I got enough to mention. He said, look, Doyle, there's some good speakers there. And there's no danger of you being elected to anything. So <laughs> we're going to go. And thank God he did, because that man gave me, like so many people, one word that helped to open up this program. I don't know what the word might be that will open it up for you. But this one word opened it up. This thing was going around. I used to think, uh, alcohol, you can't drink. Why don't they talk to my wife? Why don't they talk to my neighbors? Talk down at a Sperry Rand. They'll tell you. And this guy almost articulated that same thing, this churchman, until he said, I couldn't buy that. Until he said, I added one word to it. And I buy that. This is still my definition of alcoholism. An alcoholic is a person who can't drink safely. And the word safely is what differentiates me from my many, many friends and the Flying Tigers and other places that drink with a parent, no problem. But I have to admit that I can't do it, couldn't do it safely. And that was a good definition of alcoholism. I'd been to the doctor about it to try to get a clearance to get out of AA in the early days. And uh, he said, oh, Buck, no, 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 no. You couldn't be an alcoholic, not you, he said. No, no, he said. You come from too good a stock. <laughs> He was my uncle. <laughs> there isn't one, one in the family, you know. 
But anyway, I came here and, and I, I started agreeing that this was a physical disease. I got very interested in it. I, I used to, I still do sometimes say that I'm a, a pragmatist about alcoholics and honest, rather than the spiritual slanted type. And this is a pompous, pompous thought. What I really mean is that I'm interested in the physical disease, the physical damage, the physical person to try to do it, uh, the mechanical part. Uh, the whole program is spiritual. So it's ridiculous to say, I, I don't care for the spiritual side of the program. The whole program is spiritual and it's common sense. It's extra common sense. It's pragmatic. This is a very pra practical program because it is a spirit. And now since we're talking, now we're moving into the spiritual part. And I'm not going to tell you how uh, I have received the word or anything like that because I, I know I've received something, but I have not got the ability to articulate it as I've heard many great speakers in AA share with me, but I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. But I do know I've given it a lot of thought. And, you know, there's one thing that I think scares somebody from having listened to 25,000 speakers at least, not counting the people you talk to on the phone and at luncheons and things like that. All we talk about apparently is alcohol. And one thing is that word spiritual really seems to be a stumbling block. It's two words that have probably, that are blessed words, that have probably caused more people to uh, die, yet they're essential. They're essential, so that's, that's the price that's paid. And one of them is that word alcoholic. So many people have figured themselves out of AA. They have defined the alcoholic to be how that other person drinks, and that that isn't them. And that will kill you. It's a blessed word because it's very wonderful. We use it here as a handle. Actually, we could run this meeting here and it'd be a terrific meeting. Just like we did with the countdown. If, if people would come up here and just stop here and say, my name is so and so and I'm an alcoholic and sit down, we know a lot about that person right away. We have a shorthand. And it's a great word. And then the other word is spiritual and and that scares people until if you really analyze it, it's a word. It isn't religion. That's been underlined by several speakers. It isn't, doesn't pertain to religion. You know, you want to get it down to the ridiculous? If the word worries you, anything that's not material is spiritual. If it, if it's material, you can see it. You can bottle it up. You can um, put it in a box. You can show it off if it's material. But spiritual are just as real. The spiritual life is just as real, but it's invisible. It has no body to it. It has no form to it. Your thoughts are spiritual because none of us can see them. We may get indications, but we can't see them. I don't care what they are. You might have just been reading Penthouse. So you want to be, whatever you're thinking about that copy of Penthouse, it's spiritual as far as I'm concerned because nobody can tell you, do you? You're thinking it. And you can't box it up. Your feelings towards the people that around you are spiritual because they cannot be observed hint of your true feelings but not always people may look at you with a cat eating a mouse smile on their face and be ready to run a knife in you who knows you know you can't tell but you can't see the love that exists in this room it's plenty of it here and the reason it's spiritual, though, that's why you can't say it. Spirit means life. You know, the Indians um, believed. There was a lot of, maybe they had it. 
Maybe they probably did have it. You know, they could understand some warrior being dead from an arrow in them. But when somebody had a heart attack and they looked intact and they were all right and they couldn't figure it out and they were laying there with their mouth open, they couldn't wake them up. And they had uh, thought that the spirit had jumped out of the body because that, that is the life force. Your body, as far as I'm concerned, my body is sort of like a um, an automobile. It's driven around by my spirit, by my mind, by my brain, by my thinking. It's driven around. My brain activates all the controls of it. And that was something. You know, I used to say after I was speaking, show you how really asleep of you, to your life, how little you know about yourself is. I was speaking. i have been sober probably about seven months. And I was speaking, and I can still hear myself, and it was a pretty good talk. And I'd say, I feel so grateful that a young man like myself could find this wonderful program so early in life. And then one night driving home, if you've ever spoke, sometimes your talk reiterates through your head. And I hear myself up there talking, and I'm like Saul on the road to Damascus. There's a blinding light, sort of, not real, but just in my head a blinding light, and I hear that talk, and I say, where do you come off with this young boy stuff? You're a middle-aged old SOB with a wife and three children to raise. Come off of it. You know what happened? Emotionally, I had stopped growing as far as business good, but emotionally, I had stopped probably from the time I started drinking, probably 15 or 16 years of age. And you know, it was a wonderful feeling when that came across to me, because no longer did this 37-year-old hulk have to be driven around by a crazy 16-year-old juvenile delinquent. <laughs> it was a great pleasure. Now I could be with a guy sort of like a retired school teacher taking over. You know? <laughs> and But that, that is the hidden thing. But it took me a long time to, to adopt, uh, to understand this thinking of spiritual. And uh, only because it's Sunday, I'm working on it. So. We say, uh, we don't think anything of it when we say the Redskins really have a spirited team this year, you know. It means it's life. It's got strength. It's got power. And all of your thinking, all of your learning is all spiritual. I don't care if you've learned Higher mathematics, so don't be afraid of learning about your, the most important thing about you, about your drinking. If you have, if you are the most brilliant mathematician next to Einstein in the world today, because of your deep study, it's all spiritual, because none of us know it, unless you hit the papers with some new discovery. Then we hear about this thing that nobody can see. The great uh, talents that people have are all spiritual, except when they put them in operation. So all that stress on spirituality is to assure you it's as much part of being a human being to be spiritual as it is to breathe oxygen. It is that much. So don't fear it. <coughs> nah. Now, if you want to, after that statement, you can classify it as good spiritual or bad spiritual, but I'll leave that up to your judgment of what is good and bad, because we don't tell you here in AA. We don't judge what you do. We accept your humanity. We don't look down our nose at you and say, ha, 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 you know. You know once in a while we do. We had a famous uh, radio commentator in Washington recently, a head-on, killed a man on his way to work, a man with young children. And I was outraged. Particularly when I heard he was getting off with just a suspended sentence, you know. I was outraged. And then I had to think, wait a minute, cut it out. Who are you to judge him? You could have done the same thing. How many times did you drive home so drunk you didn't know where your car was the next day? How many times have I walked in the neighborhood looking for my car 
out of the side of my eye so nobody would know I was looking for something. They'd come out and say, did you lose your dog or something? <laughs> and then you find it. And you look it over. Not directly. You look it over. A little mud on there. A few scratches. And then the terrifying thing to peep underneath of it, act like you're looking at the tire to see whether somebody's scalp is hanging from the axle, you know. And I'd done that. Only difference was I hadn't been caught. I'd gotten away with it, that's all. Very few people get caught. The ones of us that uh, did that, very few get caught. And so I love AA because it doesn't judge. Leaves that up to my higher power. I don't reveal everything to the people in AA about myself. They wouldn't want to hear it anyway. And it wouldn't do anybody any good, maybe, on certain things. But uh, we share our experience, our strength, and our hope, but we don't preach at you. I see a lot of people doing things that I'm not inclined to do. But I probably do things that they're not inclined to do. I have a lot of resentments. Heck, I've only been in 31 years. Give me time. <laughs> resentments don't get you drunk. Alcohol gets you drunk. Resentments makes the state of not drinking unhappy, dull, unexciting, and it's not good for your health. We know that. Biblical times told us that, how smart they were, you know, they told us. They didn't tell us to turn our cheek, to love your enemy, to make you feel uh, like a sap. They did it as a health measure. They knew. You know, if I'm uh, mad at somebody, I don't like somebody. And as I told them the other day, they tell us down in Washington, if you like everybody in AA, you're not going to enough meetings. That's your problem. <laughs> but do you think I'm going to let that bum know I don't that he has that much importance that he bothers me? No. I'm going to keep it inside where it can tear me apart. Give me ulcers. Give me cancer. Give me whatever else. Give me arthritis. I don't know what might come. They say that, boy, uh... These negative feelings, but thank God we, we are helped here in AA to dispel them, which I think is spiritual. We're, they're flushed out of us. Not all of them. Of course not. As the fifth chapter says, we don't claim sainthood. But by God, we live and let live whenever we think that's what comes to my mind. Hey, well, you've been listening to that stuff. Live and let live. Forget it, you know. But if there are some people in AA that you can't bear, love them. I have a couple that I can't stand. It's worse than a resentment. It's worse than a resentment. But I love them. I love them because they're going to save my life, maybe. And you know how they're going to save it? I've got a deal in my mind. I'm sharing some of my strengths now. I've got a deal in my mind that I can, if the occasion showed up, without any feeling of remorse, without any feeling of betrayal of AA or anything, that I could sit down and drink whenever I want to, without any remorse, providing I call these two monkeys and announce it to them. <laughs> They're so rotten that I can't visualize anything that will ever happen, and yet I couldn't, that I would want to call them and let them know that they are now overtaken me. You know, I can't. So I love them. You know, we, they taught me a lot about prayer. Here I had 12 years of parochial school. And if there's anybody that can mess up the Our Father, it's a Catholic. I didn't learn to say the Our Father until I met you people. You ever hear one of us saying the rosaries? Man, you wouldn't know what we're saying. You'd think we're talking in some foreign language. <laughs> now come here and I, and I, and I hear it. I hear the, uh, how they pray the Our Father. And I guess we use it because, again, it's a very spiritual thing. Pragmatic! The Lord's Prayer is pragmatic. 
very practical. Give us this day. 2,000 years ago, they were talking a day at a time. Give us, even use the slang of today, our daily bread. He ain't going to give you enough bread for tomorrow, enough money. That's what the kids call bread. Give us this day, our daily bread. That's all we're entitled to, one day at a time. And you go through it, and you've got a whole AA talk right in the Lord's Prayer. So when he gave that to us, he knew what he was talking about. He was 2,000 years ahead of us telling us how to live. But we come in here, and we start enjoying life. And now I'll tell you the things that I thought about life. You know, I read of a guy, you read about him, he hit a lottery for $40 million. Can you imagine that? Hitting a lottery for $40 million? You can. But do you know that each of us here have hit a far greater lottery? The fact you're here, that the fact that you're in being, forget about alcoholism. This is true of anybody. It's a great gift. The odds against any one of us having ever been are so tremendous that 40 million is like a sure shot. Billions, trillions times billions. All the stars in the universe. For everything. The odds against any one of us. If, if we'd been conceived a day later, we might have been a different person. You know, this, it all had to come together. Our parents had to meet someplace. They had to get acquainted. My kids, uh, if I hadn't been in that beer joint that night, they wouldn't be here today. So, I mean, more I think of that life, you know, the, the great gift we have, no matter what our condition and it is, the fact that we have the privilege of life is so amazing. And yet, how did I live my life before I met you people? Well, a lot of it was good. A lot of it was good. It wasn't all bad. But you know how I was living it near the end? I was living it like I was going to come back for seconds. You don't come back for seconds. No, no. Nobody's coming back for seconds. This is it. Just like reading in Washington, some uh, woman around there had hit the lottery for a million dollars and she was on welfare and broke now. But she still plays. She said, well, the next time I hit it, I'm going to be a lot more careful. She doesn't know. You don't come around a second time. She, she grabbed the ring once. And, but the poet tells us, hey, take time out as you pass this way to smell the flowers. Not four roses. Take time out as you pass it to smell the flowers because you're not coming this way again. And yet I didn't know that. I didn't seem to understand that. Because I wasted many, many. I'm not talking about the good times. I wasted many, many. I'm not, I'm not talking about material things like a lost career, which I have no regrets for, of going up and paying this. Now, you people have taught me that this is the way it had to be. I'm, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to pay the price to meet. By the way, when I say something up here, I want new people to know this. Whenever any of us talk up here, I think the onus is on us. To only tell the truth. So anything I tell you is the absolute truth up here. Now, when I'm not up here, be aware, maybe, but because uh, I've been a salesman all my life. But And when I say this, I sincerely mean it. I think the people in AA, I know the people in AA, are the greatest aggregation of human beings that anybody can ever have the privilege of knowing. The people in AA are the... Most wonderful people in the world. Every one of you, you're different. You're something. You really are that. That's true. And that's spiritually how I feel. That's my spiritual feeling. And these people here have done everything. You know, they say something of value. Bob Rourke wrote the book, Something of Value, where he criticized, rightly so, that the missionaries going to Africa took so many of their customs and privileges away from them, but they didn't replace it with something of value. They had their civilization, and we took it away, but they didn't replace it with something of value. And, uh, you know, if the dentist takes rottenness out of your tooth, you got a terrible toothache, so you go there, and he grinds that rottenness out, and now all the rottenness is out of your tooth. Unless he fills it 
you're going to be in worse shape than you ever did. And likewise to me, I look on my drinking had become such an important part of my life. In my eyes, not that it was that valuable, not that it had any value. Now it had actually turned on me. It was a poison to me, but I didn't know this. But to me, it was something of great value. And AA took it away from me. But thank God you people were there to replace it with something so far greater than anything I ever dreamt of. And I say to the new person, believe it. Believe it. Because I was not a believer when I came here, I can assure you that. But they did. And you know how they did it? I'll tell you how they did it. Now let's again forget about just alcohol. Let's look at human beings in life. That guy wouldn't know about life. I thought it was a good thing. I don't know about life, but I know about my life in AA quite a bit. And how do people live? You got that? You've hit the great lottery. You are now in being. You are a human being. You are occupying the world. You are occupying space for a limited period of time. And how did we live it? Now this is an alcoholism. Just how do good people or anybody live it? Well, the way I observe it is if you are a uh, lawyer, you hang out mostly with people involved in the field of law. Oh, sure, you have a few neighbor friends, but uh, if you're in construction, your tendency is to hang out with people in construction work. Doctors hang out with medical people. Um, construction workers are likewise. People down at Sperry Rand used to say to me, used to get me mad, they'd say, hey, when are you going to get back in the mainstream of life? What do you mean? Well, all you do is every night you're out with them drunks. I'd get mad at them. So one day I got thinking, what are they talking about the mainstream of life that I should get back into? Well, you know what I was? I was an adding machine salesman. You know who I hung out with in the mainstream of life? Mostly other adding machine salesmen or people who brought adding machines from adding machine salesmen. Now, how damn dull can you get? <laughs> <laughs> so I was going through this one life only savoring people in my what they now call your peer group. Well, fine people, nice people. But I didn't know about the other people until I met you people. The only other time I had something similar to this was doing World War II, which was a pretty good war in that they didn't have a lot of exemptions and they, there was a conglomeration of human beings from every walk of life. I jumped into a slit trench in China one day and the guy standing next to me and I knees up to water, was the director and the producer of King Kong, who was on General Chennault's staff. I jumped in another time, and it was Joe Alsop, the famous columnist at that time, and Ted White, who's written books on China. You never knew who you'd run into. You might run into Mary over there in China, which we did. But uh, So World War II in a, in a small way, but nothing to compare with AA. World War II, you did have this uh, touch of other people. You got to know people of different colors, different backgrounds, different educational standards, different positions in life. You did learn something about them. But it wasn't until I got to AA that I found the people, and we're the only people that have this great privilege. I don't care what other organization. We're not an organization. We're a fellowship, but let's call it an organization for the new people. I don't know of any other. I don't think there is one that goes right across the whole spectrum of society. Our members in this room here are some very wealthy people, also some very poor people. I know. I don't know. I know there are some very educated people in here, and I know there's probably some illiterate people, people who can't read and write. I told one story yesterday at that Asher basket, which we didn't have all yourself throw it at you, to show you how lucky you are. You know, I, one of the greatest helps I got in AA, I'd never met this guy. He was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. But he had wisdom. And when I first came to AA, I was going out every night to meetings. My wife said, uh, you know how wife said, uh, you might just well be drunk is the way you are. You're out of the meetings. You're out every night. And I'm bitching at a meeting to him, and he says, Buck, how many cars do you have? 
He didn't say to me, have you ever considered going to a marriage counselor, which would have messed up my sex life and everything else, I guess, you know. He didn't say that. He said, how many cars do you have? I said, I don't see what that has to do with it. He said, I do. He said, you know, you said your wife has three little kids. Do you realize that when you leave home, you only have one car? She's stranded there. The kids get sick. If they need something at the store, she doesn't have any transportation. She doesn't want you there. She wants the car. <laughs> she just thinks she wants you there. You are there. You're identified in her mind as the car. He said, why don't you loosen up and buy her a second-hand car? So I went on and said, I'm buying your car. She said, where'd you get that idea? I said, a guy in AA told me. Boy, she fell in love with AA overnight. <laughs> She's been going to meetings with me ever since. And it solved our problem. You know, a simple solution. It wasn't complicated. It was pragmatic. You know? And yet I've had also the privilege of knowing Pulitzer Prize winners. I know movie stars out in Mary's area that know me. I'd never met adding machine salesmen don't meet their movie stars. I still like to meet them. You know, I like to meet people like that. I like to meet these in But I also like to meet the people that work uh, sitting at a table here. And, you know, it always is true. You never know who you sit next to talking. And the, the guys are so interesting. They have talents that I would never have known about. They do things that I've never, would never have dreamt of. But I know about them because I, and I've met you people. And all over, I, I know people at every level. I know doctors. I know lawyers. I know them all. I don't just know adding machine sales when you catch it. And because of that, I can guarantee you that AA can never be dull. Because we're not all stamped out. We're not all stamped out the same. We're different. The way we approach the program, we're different. Our careers are different. But we have a common denominator in that we care for each other spiritually. Because we have the community of having a fatal disease that we have found out that by helping each other we help ourselves. That by attempting to help somebody else, we become stronger and happier in our own sobriety. We find that by trying to carry this message, we run into adventures that we never dreamt of. I was in the, I mentioned the Flying Tigers for that reason. We had adventures. But I'll tell you, my years here in AA have been far more exciting, far more adventurous, far more interesting. And at the same time, my membership here has enabled me to enjoy that regular group of people. I love to, I throw a big 200 people party every May down in Washington, a memorial party for my flying tigers. About a hundred of them and their wives show up. It's a weekend of partying. And I'm allowed to do that because I'm a member of AA. I couldn't do that if I wasn't a member of AA because I'd be stone drunk. I'd be dead. I wouldn't be here. Because of you people that are sober, I've had a lot of things. I was invited down on an Air Force plane after I'd been sober just a short while to dedicate an airfield down at Lake Charles for General Chenault, anybody here from Lake Charles, Louisiana. I've had all these exciting things added on top of the main excitement of knowing the greatest people in the world, the people in AA. So my cup runneth over with happiness, with joy, with excitement, with fun. I still don't want to be a stick in the mud. Most of my friends I, outside of AA, they are sitting around every night just, you know, I'll tell you another thing, you know. I said to wife one time, I run and I exercise and I, I'm always out and I'm waving my hands around talking. And I said to my wife, you know, it's a damn good thing I became an alcoholic. I said, because I'd have been dead at least ten years ago. What do you mean? I said, if I hadn't been an alcoholic, I'd have been sitting at home every day. And I said, with all this action I have, I still have a weight problem. I'd have been swallowed up in fat ten years ago. It's a pragmatic program. It's practical. It keeps us moving. It keeps us, it keeps us exposed to new ideas. And it gets better all the time. I can assure all of us that stood up during the count. I think that's a very important reason why we should let people know how long we've been here. Because I was so afraid that, hey, 
What happens after a year? What happens after two years? In Dullesville? No. You couldn't keep us coming around if this was just an endurance contest. We come around because there's a feeling in this room, again, spiritual, that we love to indulge in. Thank you all, and God bless you, and thank you for having me here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.